玩笑后见有名，波地名选是 Kieran Jinchan Warming Jingji Chalong Ninth。Building. It was published in the in 2010 by author Zhao Jingji and translated by Jeremy Chiang into the English for 2022. Born in 1952, Zhao's adolescence would coincide with Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution, which first started in 1966. The Cultural Revolution, which lasted a decade, was to, in a nutshell, remove bourgeois capitalistic and traditional elements from Chinese society. The Cultural Revolution, to Mao, it could be argued, was to ensure that China was to give power back to the proletariat and to ensure that China was not to rescind back to its previous ways. However, any idea that Mao seemingly had ultimately resorted to violence and the descent in to chaos. But let's have a look at Mao Zedong's track record. Prior to the Cultural Revolution, we had Mao's idea of the Great Leap Forward. Five-year plans that were meant to industrialize and modernize through the reconstitution of land and the reconstruction of the agrarian economy which fed the people. Mao decided to over-exaggerate what he was going to do, leading to non-existent surpluses of food being collected. This non-existent surplus was somehow meant to feed the existent people of China, which ultimately led to the Great Chinese Famine of 59 to 61, which is argued to be the second, if not the worst famine in all of human history. One of the monumental histories of China is the CG, which is the record of the grand historian. It states, Me and Yi Shi Wei Tan. Food is the priority of the people. It is a basic rule, it is a fundamental rule, and ultimately it can be the rule to your downfall. As leader, Mao knew this and therefore decided to pen within the Little Red Book, the propagandist text that would fuel the Cultural Revolution. He wrote that people should bombard the headquarters and to rebel is justified. Mao didn't take personal responsibility, instead decided to shift the blame to the bourgeois, the capitalists, and got people to rebel. He got people to turn on their own kin. And this is important because in the early part of Ninth Building we have this, to rebel is justified. Ninth Building is split up into two Part. The first part is within the apartment block in Beijing, where Zhao, or the narrator of Zhao, is dictating his childhood and adolescence within Beijing, observing the Cultural Revolution as it is currently going on. In the second part, Zhao is a lot older and is to be deported to the Great Northern Waste, where the Cultural Revolution is still ongoing but will seep in towards the end of the narrative. For what Ninth Building is, I am unsure. I cannot tell if it was diary entries written by Zhao because he didn't write this in a short space of time. He began writing in 1996, these small vignettes. Some of them were published in 1997. Additional vignettes were added. It was expanded to the work Ninth Building that we have in front of us. Are these diary entries? Is this autofiction? Is it memoir? However, we do know that Zhao told the English translator Tiang to treat this as a work of fiction. Therefore, to pin this book down is quite tricky. What also doesn't help, and it is something that I've seen within contemporary Chinese fiction, is that there's a distancing quality. The characters and the action is very removed. I don't think this is helped by the fact that within Ninth Building there are characters aplenty. Every single vignette has new people introduced who never really seem to pop up again. In regards to the action of why it is so distant, there is so much mundanity within the individual vignettes that you have swathes of tedium to move through before you get into violent Act. See the Red Guards and other people treat others like animals. See dead bodies on the street whipping the elderly, making them subhuman. Seeing them only as a bourgeois symbol that must be eradicated. Especially within the first part as this is told through a child's eyes, there is a lens of brevity. In the old book of Tan, in the biography of Yao Qingtong, there's a famous Chinese proverb which I think summarizes what I think Zhao wanted to do with Ninth Building. And that is, Dang Zhu Zhu Mi, 
Pang Guangzhu Shi, which is that the player is lost and the spectator is clear. Meaning that when someone is currently in the situation Zhao in regards to the Cultural Revolution, they don't really have any comprehension, they don't really have any retrospective aspects that they can fall on because it is currently happening to them. Us as the reader, because we are spectated this, because we can have knowledge of the Cultural Revolution. And I would like to stress that I think going into this you should have some idea of what the Cultural Revolution was. But us readers, the spectators, can understand and contextualise what is currently going on. However, there is so much mundanity and the text is so removed that there's not really much retrospection that you could give. I mean, the first part was basically Adrian Mao, aged 13 and three quarters, a right at the end to quote another Chinese classic in English, Disney's Mulan, we have old poems. How sweet. Why? Even the afterword from Zhao himself saying, well, this is a little bit tedious, isn't it? It was a little bit of a slap in the face. Now, I'm not here to say that books about the Cultural Revolution should solely focus on the bloody, the gruesome, the abhorrent. But I'm saying I don't see the need for books that deal with historical abhorrencies. Let's, let's take it out of China. Let's talk about all over the world to tell me that some people gambled their time away. Doctor Strange could peer into the multiverse. I don't think there is an iteration of me that enjoyed this. I mean, I had very similar things to say in regards to Knausgaard's My Struggle, which documents Knausgaard talking about his very mundane, boring life for over 6,000 pages. People like reading about very mundane things, very boring things that seemingly are uninterested, unconnected, because it's it's somewhat more realistic, it's somewhat more naturalistic to know that people do these things. I understand there's going to be people who are going to absolutely adore this and appreciate it for what it is. I don't know what Ninth Building was trying to do, I don't know what it was trying to tell me apart from Chinese people, if it's a boring Tuesday, will probably gamble the time away. And you know what? I probably could have guessed that because the Chinese absolutely love gambling. I tell you one of the best things I ever did and what I will tell everyone. If you go to a casino, you go and sit where the Chinese are because the Chinese have an absolute laugh. They are there for the hysterics. They are there for the banter. They are some of the best people I have ever met with in a casino. I love playing Mahjong. I still don't think I fully understand the rules of Mahjong, but when I used to play with the old lady Zhu, she, I mean, she took all my money and she was very happy, but I had an absolute whale of a time. Is this meant to be tense? Because the only tension that I can see in this book is, is the binding holding the pages together. The Cultural Revolution is the backdrop to this and it clearly has an impact on the story, but because the narrator is is in the mists of it, it, it's just like, oh, there's a dead person on the road. Oh, the Red Guards are over there. Ah, oh, my friend's parents are having sex. Oh, maybe we should dob them in. Everyone's hungry. I used to have a violin teacher called Mr. Yu, but it turns out it was Mr. Yao. Are you just like, why? I don't know why any of these details mean anything. Don't think I could be enlightened by banality. Like, if I wanted something tedious to read about the Cultural Revolution, I'd go to Wikipedia. This was boring, and somehow, that's the point! Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know. I absolutely hated it. So, I I'm giving it like a two in the Testaments Club. In the Testaments Club you go. Two days of my life.